Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining in a time of online worship and reflection. You are joining the folks from Craigsbank Parish Church and Kestolfen Old Parish Church. My name is Alan Childs and I'm the minister at Craigsbank Church. Can I invite you to join in as you feel free to do with the singing of our hymn for today. Let us sing. Galatians chapter 5 For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. However, you bite and devour one another. Take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided 
by the Spirit. Blessed be the word of the Lord. May I ask you a personal question? Tell me, are you a good person? Do you think you are a good person? Well, Alan, you might say, it depends. It depends on what you mean by good. Do you mean, am I an agreeable, friendly person, generally nice to other folks? Do you mean, am I a law-abiding person, doing my bit as a responsible citizen? Or do you mean, I, am I morally good, not lying and stealing, but rather helping out and respecting others? To be honest, that's just it. That's the question. How would you define good? That's why it's a personal question. Not only because you know whether you live up to your standards of goodness, but they are very much your standards. So the question is really twofold. Are you a good person? And what do you mean by good? Anyway, it's a question that's been keeping people busy for literally millennia. Countless books and courses and theories and programs have been written and produced focusing on just that. To the point where we even have some television series called The Good Doctor and another one called The Good Wife. So, thousands of years ago, famous Greek philosophers kept their listeners and their pupils and their opponents busy with their theories of the good life and the good spirit. And although there are a lot of differences in these theories, one of the main themes that kept surfacing in their theories and their arguments was virtues. Certain, certain virtues are good. Or to put it differently, to be a good person or to live a good life, you had to aspire to or attain certain virtues or values. Now, many lists of different values and virtues were proposed by clever Greek philosophers, and they did not agree on what these lists always should contain, but they did agree that you had to aspire to attain them. A typical list of virtues was that of the famous Greek philosopher Aristotle. His list included virtues such as bravery, moderation, style, ambition, calmness. So those virtues, um, the virtuous person would live out outwardly, and they could be perceived by others, yet they would start those virtues from an internal place, from your own goodness of your character, your inner being. Now, that was common, generally accepted. It was a way of looking at goodness or virtuousness back in the ancient Middle Eastern Mediterranean world that Jesus and the Apostle Paul and the early church found itself in. And that was also part of the classical philosophical training that the Apostle Paul was educated in, him having had a Greek classical education. But you probably also know that this same Apostle, who wrote most of the New Testament part of the Bible, that he was a Jew, just like Jesus was a Jew, just like the first followers of Jesus were, and just like most of the first folks that made up the early church back in Jerusalem, shortly after Jesus' death. Almost all were Jews. And the Jewish culture understood being good in, in a bit of a different way. Their, standard, uh, their standards were, firstly, what is your relationship to the God of Israel, Yahweh? And secondly, how do you live out your responsibilities 
to your own people. Let me repeat that. What is your standing with God? And secondly, what is your standing in relation to your, your community? And the best way to measure those two metrics, those two standards, according to the Jews of the time of Jesus of Nazareth. So around the time just before, just after Jesus' birth, the standard they, they used was the person's adherence to the law. How strictly did they live up to the expectations of the Torah, the Jewish law of Moses, with all its major and its minor statutes and regulations? So it was very much an externally prescriptive set of rules spelling out what one's life should look like to ensure that you are in good standing with Yahweh, God, and that you are fulfilling your due responsibilities to your community, particularly to your kinsmen, your, your fellow Jews. So the Jewish world said, here are the rules of what a good person's life should look like. Now go and do it. Largely with a focus on, on the community or the collective fellows with a clear acknowledgement of God. And the Hellenic or the Greek world, on the other hand, said, well, here are lists of virtues that a good person should embody or live, uh, or live out from your character, largely with a focus on the individual, with very little, if any, acknowledgement of God or God's. So when Jesus of Nazareth comes onto the scene, this rabbi, rabbi within the Jewish community, he adds some interesting dimensions to the conversation about goodness. Jesus starts off by affirming the value of the Jewish law, the Torah, the law of Moses. But he makes it clear that no one can really fulfill all of it. So as good as it is, it is at best a guide, not a guarantee that you are in good standing with God. Jesus then also expands the range and the diversity of whom your responsibilities of care stretches to. And that is that it stretches to whoever crosses your path and not only your own people. So yes, it is necessary to live a good life and to honor God. But you are actually unable and more is required than what is originally expected. Jesus actually says at one point, no one is good except God. Now sometime after Jesus of Nazareth's death, one of his eventual followers, arguably his most avid follower, Paul of Tarsus, he makes this, he takes this, he makes this wonderful mix of the original Jewish concept of goodness and the Greek concept of goodness, and he mixes in Jesus' teaching and Jesus' sacrifice and a special extra ingredient, which I'll tell you about shortly. But he, Paul, having been trained in both the law of the Jews and the philosophies of the Greeks, and being a keen follower of Jesus of Nazareth, he then mixes these three important ingredients and he serves up the most amazing wisdom of what being a good person is. You can be good because of God. Yes, you heard me correctly. You can be good because of God. Because of God, you can be good in a, a deeper, a better, a newer way that we might have previously thought not possible. Now, how is that possible? You might wonder. I know myself, although I want to be brave or honest or kind or patient or friendly, 
I know that deep inside that sometime I'm, sometimes I'm not. I can sometimes also be cowardly or dishonest or unkind or unfriendly. So by the Greek virtue requirements, I'm only sometimes and only partly a good person. So how is it possible to be good? I know myself, although I want to be brave or honest or kind or patient or friendly, I know that deep inside that sometimes I'm not. I can sometimes also be cowardly or dishonest or unkind or unfriendly. So by the Greek virtue requirements, I am only sometimes and only partly a good enough person by these virtue standards. So how is it possible to be good? And I know I should not steal or desire somebody else's successes at his or her expense, or I should not work as if my work defines me. All of these are matters that the Jewish law took very seriously. But I know that even therein, I do sometimes fail. So how is it possible then to be good? This is what Jesus' number one fan from back in the day says. You are right. You cannot be perfectly good. But it's okay. Jesus, by virtue of his virtuous life and death, made up for your and my shortcomings. So if we acknowledge our shortcomings and rather claim the achievements of Jesus as our own, then we can relax from our anxiety of never being perfectly good, because we cannot be. But if you believe that Jesus was perfectly good, to the point of meeting the requirements of the Jewish law, then if you ally yourself with Jesus, if you appreciate that Jesus' life and death makes up for your own failures, then you are on the right path towards eventual goodness. Hey, wait a second. That's a cop-out. How can you do that? Just say, I do not have to live a good life because Jesus did. That's shirking my responsibility. That's chickening out. From the challenge of living a life that is morally responsible on either a personal or societal level, isn't it? You can't do that. That is where Paul of Tarsus says, well, no. Because... When you claim the life and death of Jesus, you do so by acknowledging him as your Lord, your master, your king, and yes, even as God. That's the only way to claim the goodness, the goodness credits of Jesus as your own. The concept that the Bible uses to talk of this, getting the benefits of Jesus' achievements, his virtuousness, is Our sins are forgiven by the sacrifice of Jesus. Your and my failures to be good enough are deleted, balanced out, rectified by all the goodness and the sacrifices and effectively the perfection of Jesus in his life and death. But it does not stop there. If you believe in Jesus as your Lord, and the one to forgive your sins, as the one to wash you clean, as the one who makes goodness possible for you, then the very same spirit, the same essence, the power, the character of Jesus will be yours. And that is where the Spirit of God features. Jesus promises his followers his spirit. Paul of Tarsus says, It is the Spirit of God that lives within the followers of Jesus that enables us to continue becoming more and more like Jesus. The phrase he uses is the fruit of the Spirit. 
That's the extra special element I mentioned. The fruit of the Spirit, Paul writes, are the well-known characteristics listed in the letter to the Galatians that we read earlier. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It does sound somewhat like a, a Greek list of virtues, but it's quite different in the sense that it is not virtues that are aspired to out of how wonderful my personal character is. Rather, it is the result of God's Spirit living in me. The more I submit to the Spirit of God, the more these indicators of God's perfectly loving, life-affirming character will be visible in and through my relationships with others. You see, an apple tree bears apples, and an orange tree bears oranges. Similarly, if the Spirit of God resides in you, which will be the case if you have given your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will be able to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is the Spirit of Jesus Christ which is the Spirit of God. So getting back to my original question of whether you are a good person, if I understand the Gospel correctly, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I will answer it this way. No, I am not. But the Spirit of God that is alive within me is perfectly good and helps me daily to be better. Thank God for that. Amen. Shall we pray together? Loving, listening God, you are the giver of all good gifts, the author of love and the sustainer of life. You turn mourning into dancing. You mend the brokenhearted. For you are ever attentive to the voices of those in need. And that is why we call on your name, so that we might live. Please hear our prayers for the faith communities that bear Christ's name that the world may know we are Christ's disciples by the love that we have for one another and for our compassion for our neighbours. For leaders of the nations, we pray, and all persons in positions of authority, that their lives may be marked by Christ-like service and love and integrity. We pray for all who are oppressed and in captivity, physically, emotionally or spiritually, that they may be guarded against evil and death to find the space of freedom that you have promised. We pray for refugees wherever they find themselves, that they will find a safe haven, hospitality, and that peace and life will return to their homelands. We pray for those who are hungry and thirsty this day and for those who have too much, that we may learn to share your generous gifts. We pray for those who are dealing with loss or facing death, that the presence of Christ may bless and keep them. We also pray for an earth tired from human consumption, that she will be rejuvenated into the paradise that you had first intended and that you have in mind at the renewal of all things. O oh God, you know each one of us inside out. Answer us in our day of trouble so that we may share in your comforting in the presence of your people giving thanks.
for all your goodness to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. God bless you and keep you as we go our different ways until we meet again.